Good morning, Arise Church, friends, family, visitors, uh, those unable to make it to our service at Green Oak Ranch uh, this morning at 9 a.m. This morning we are looking in God's Word at a story of evangelism and conversion in Acts chapter 8. So we'll read Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go south toward the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, like a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, when they came to some water, the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Let's pray and ask God to use these words to bless us and speak to us this morning. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this story of Philip and this Ethiopian eunuch and of your great power and grace. We pray that we would see in this story what you have done for us and also how we can share the good news with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At Arise, we are a new church plant, not because we don't believe there are any good churches around in this North County area. There are, certainly, but because we believe there are many more people who need to hear the good news about Jesus. And we want to be a missional church that is sharing the good news with friends and family and neighbors and also strangers and meeting people and making new relationships. That's why I thought it would be helpful for us to consider this morning a, a, a story about evangelism and a conversion and about the power of the good news of Jesus Christ. So let's look. So we've just read that story here in Acts, and let's notice a few things about this story. First, uh, this was uh, a very unlikely convert, this Ethiopian man. Uh, he was not a Jew. He was a foreigner, but not just a, a regular foreigner, if there were such a thing. He wasn't a Roman or an Egyptian. He was from the kingdom of Ethiopia. And the ancient kingdom of Ethiopia was mostly in the area that we would now call Sudan. And this uh, was in the distant southern lands below Egypt, and it was a wealthy and powerful kingdom, but it was also a strange kingdom. For example, it was ruled by a woman. The queen mother held the title Candace. That's because they thought that the king was very nearly divine, so he shouldn't get involved with the messy dealings of politics and running a country. So the queen mother would rule in his place. Being from Sudan, we can safely guess that this Ethiopian eunuch had a very dark complexion. So he would have stood out. But there's more. This man was also a eunuch. 
The practice of making boys and men into eunuchs was sadly common in the ancient world. And typically, those boys or men were not made eunuchs voluntarily. They were often slaves or prisoners who had no choice. This involved typically castration, sometimes more, and this was done to those who would be slaves and would work as officials in certain positions, often involving royal women, like working for the queen, which is what this man did. This man's physical condition was a problem in Israel. You see, though he was a worshiper of Yahweh, the law stated that he could not have been admitted as a full convert to Judaism. He couldn't fully participate in the temple worship. Deuteronomy 23 verse 1 says, No one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. These regulations may seem strange to us today, but they served an important purpose in the ancient world. It was necessary to prevent pagan practices from being included in the worship of God, because that's often, again, where these kinds of things were done. Eunuchs would typically serve in the temples of the various gods. God said he didn't want to have anything to do with that. Um, this prohibition against uh, those who were mutilated, injured, altered, was also meant to teach the perfection of God, that God is perfect, and so those serving in his temple must also be perfect, and the sacrifices offered must be perfect. So this was part of a, um, this was meant to teach the Israelites something by showing them the perfection of God. And finally, this prohibition also taught something very important spiritually, and that is that God is a God of life. And that to, to do this, to, to have a, a eunuch serving in the temple would be, um, would be contrary to this image of God as a God of life. Now, please don't understand. These regulations did not mean that eunuchs couldn't have had any place among God's people. This was only referring to, uh, to those special religious gatherings at the temple, those formal gatherings. But still, it would mean that uh, he wasn't able to fully participate. And it also probably meant that he would have been mistreated and devalued by many Jews. Not that the law commanded them to do that, but by human nature, he would have been, people like to put others down, to break people into classes. And so it was very likely that he was looked down on, ostracized by those other worshipers of Yahweh that he encountered in Jerusalem. So this man was a Gentile. He was from a very foreign land. He's sort of a foreigner of foreigners, and he was a eunuch. Putting it all together, this man would have been the epitome of foreignness to the Jews. He was the least likely convert. Also, there were uh, so many unlikely circumstances. What are the odds that this man would have heard about the God of Israel at all? What are the odds that he would have been interested in worshiping him? What are the odds that he would just happen to be on a trip to Jerusalem and at that time? And what are the odds that he would meet this evangelist Philip on an empty road? And what are the odds that he would believe the message about Jesus that so many others rejected and that he would come to faith and be baptized? And yet, this man Philip, uh, this man met Philip while reading Isaiah. He heard the message about Jesus. He believed and was baptized. And this story shows us several important truths about evangelism. First, it shows us that evangelism is God's work. Is evangelism all up to us? Do we just need to find a few willing people to go out and evangelize and and figure out some clever techniques, and then we'll have the secret to evangelism, we'll have everything we need? Of course not. Evangelism is a divine mission. It starts with God. This story reminds us that God is personally involved in the missionary work of the church. God personally orchestrated this event for one man to come to faith. God directed Philip to encounter this man 
on the road to share with him the good news about Jesus. This, in this case, it sounds like God may have miraculously transported Philip. And if that's the case, then Philip was literally along for the ride. In evangelism, we follow the Spirit. We are led by the Spirit, and the Spirit of God goes before us, and he works powerfully. We are, in many ways, along for the ride. And how did the Ethiopian eunuch end up on that road at that time? The Holy Spirit must have been working in his heart for many, many years. And he brought this man from far away, uh, all the way to Jerusalem in order to be saved. Perhaps God's plans for this man's salvation began much earlier in the Old Testament, when the Queen of Sheba visited Solomon. Sheba was um, a precursor to this Ethiopian kingdom that this man would have come from. So perhaps that's how the word about the God of Israel came back to this ancient kingdom of Ethiopia. You see, God's plans and providences span from the beginning of time to eternity. God is in control. God is working out his mission. How is God directing us in our lives? It might mean that we need to look for the opportunities that God is placing before us. How is God directing you even in this pandemic? I have met more neighbors during this pandemic because people have been closer to home, because people have not a lot else to do, so more people are walking around the neighborhood. Maybe that's part of God's plan for me to talk to more of my neighbors about Jesus, or maybe some neighbor in particular. What about you? Of course, we need to be active in evangelism. But we must recognize that we are simply part of God's plan. If you are a Christian, I'm sure you know this to be true because you can look in your own life and see how God has brought you to faith. And it wasn't, it wasn't your doing, and it wasn't all uh, just one person somewhere. God was orchestrating events. He was preparing your heart, speaking through the message. You can see God at work if you look back on your own experience. So the first thing we learn about evangelism is that it's God's work. God is still God, even in evangelism. He is powerful, he is in control, and he is providential. That means he oversees the circumstances. Second, God's priorities in evangelism are not worldly priorities. This seems like a great story of a man coming to faith. But you might also think about what Philip could have been doing if he weren't on that road that desert road. You know, ministry had been going very well for Philip in Samaria. Philip actually had a thriving ministry up there. Uh, Acts 8 verse 6 says, And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. Crowds of people. Uh, verse 12 says, When they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So this is these are big crowds of men and women and and even children presumably there as well. God was blessing Philip's ministry with success. There were many conversions and baptisms taking place. And then just as things were going so well, God told Philip to go somewhere else. Rise and go south toward the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And then Luke tells us, oh, by the way, this is a desert place. To sort of emphasize that this was very strange from a human perspective. Things are going so well and he sends them off to the desert. Human beings strategizing might not have chosen this path. What was Philip going to do? Preach to the sand? But as, So as amazing as this encounter and this conversion was, Philip perhaps could have been sharing the gospel with many Samaritans instead. So the lesson here is that God is in control of the mission. And that God's priorities are not our priorities. God could have chosen a more populous nation as his chosen people, but he didn't. God could have blessed Jesus with more success in his earthly ministry, but he didn't. God doesn't count the way we count. In fact, in the Bible, God seems to go out of his way to teach us, uh, to try to break us of this human tendency to measure significance by size 
and numbers. These are worldly metrics, and Jesus teaches us different metrics. Jesus says that there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Luke 15, verse 7. Jesus also describes himself and God on his mission as a shepherd who leaves the 99 and pursues the one. And then he says, And if he finds it, truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. In Philip, in, in Acts 8, Philip was told to leave the 99 and to go seek the one. And how much rejoicing there was over that one Ethiopian eunuch that was brought to faith. Here at Arise, we are a little church plant. And I hope we will take this point to heart. You are already living this out if you are a part of Arise, because yes, we are small, but that doesn't mean our ministry is unimportant. That doesn't mean that God doesn't have plans for us to use us. We may not share the gospel with thousands, although who knows what God might do. But maybe God's mission is for us to seek the lonely one, the overlooked one, the needy one. Because God has compassion. And out of his sheer grace, he pursues not just crowds of people, but specific people. God chooses those whom he will pursue and save by his Holy Spirit. Not just big crowds, not indiscriminate. He pursues out of his grace and love. Third, uh, third lesson about evangelism here is that the good news is for all people. And yes, it means all kinds of people in all kinds of circumstances and with different backgrounds. I think as human beings, we are sometimes tempted to write people off. We think Jesus can possibly save this person, or maybe Jesus couldn't possibly save those types of people. Well, the Ethiopian eunuch was probably written off by uh, and rejected by many Jews in Jerusalem, many of God's people. Maybe it's not accidental that he left very unfulfilled from Jerusalem. But he was not written off by Jesus. He was not written off by Jesus' church. Jesus said, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts 1 verse 8. And here Jesus shows he will go to the ends of the earth to save this Ethiopian eunuch. I need to say here that it would be a terrible mistake, and it is a terrible mistake, for Christians to uncritically join the culture wars that rage around us. The danger is, if we do, that we might turn people who are supposed to be our neighbors, people we are supposed to have compassion on and love and, and to share the good news of Jesus with, we will turn people who should be neighbors into enemies. Christian, are there uh, people or kinds of people that you look down on? Are there people that you look down on because they're different or maybe because they're broken and sinful in one way or another. You know, it's, you're probably aware that our culture believes that Christians are against people who identify as LGBTQ and all the other um, forms of sexuality that are present in our culture. Is that true of us? Is that true in our hearts? I hope not. As as after all, aren't we ourselves just broken sinners who have been saved by Jesus? Are we really so different? Jesus chose not to be our enemy. He chose to have compassion. We can remain committed to following Jesus and his laws and still be kind and respectful and compassionate to all people, to all sinners, because that's what Jesus himself did. Any man or woman you meet might be someone God is calling you to love and to share the good news about Jesus with. So the good news is for all people. And then fourth about evangelism. Evangelism is sharing the good news of salvation and restoration and belonging and more in Jesus. It's the good news about Jesus. What drew this man to Jerusalem in the first place? What interested him about uh, Yahweh, 
the God of Israel, or about Isaiah. It must have been good news. You know, people don't seek God because of bad news. They seek God because of good news. Perhaps God used the unjust and hard circumstances of this man's life to cause him to seek hope and meaning even in the farthest places of earth. He had this scroll of Isaiah, so I think it's safe to assume that he had read a couple chapters ahead, and he had read Isaiah 56, verses 3 to 8, where we read these words. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my, off, my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him beside those, besides those already gathered. What amazing promises. Did this man, this Ethiopian eunuch who had so much taken from him, who was denied the things that mattered most in the ancient world, descendants. Uh, did he find hope and comfort when he read these words uh, from God and about God in Isaiah? When he read about God who promised to welcome him and give him something better than descendants, when he read about a God who would not turn away a foreigner, even if when he arrived in Jerusalem he discovered that the laws did have some limits upon him. There were promises of something more. Promises that would lead him to Jesus. But before he heard about Jesus, he left Jerusalem unfulfilled. And as I said, that may not have been accidental. Perhaps he left unfulfilled in part because the Jews had forgotten God's mission. Jesus pointed this out, how they had taken what was supposed to be a house of prayer for the nations and they had turned it into uh, a terrible place filled with greed and pride. The Jews had become proud, worldly, prejudiced. So Jesus cleared the temple. And for us, there's a warning for the church today. We need to be warned that we don't forget our mission and start turning away the very people who are supposed to find God when they come to us. So this man, he went to Jerusalem, he left with more questions than answers, he left with emptiness, which was also perhaps part of God's plan to show us that no longer would he be met in the temple, no longer was the religion of the old covenant valid, but now people must find God through Jesus. And so the Ethiopian eunuch asked a very good question. As he was reading Isaiah, Philip heard him reading out loud, came up to him, and, uh, and, and Philip asked him if he knew what he was reading, and the Ethiopian eunuch said, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? When he talked about the, the sufferings of this servant, this sheep who was led to the slaughter, whose life would be taken away. And Philip told him, about Jesus. Only Jesus fits the description of the man that the Ethiopian eunuch was fascinated with in Isaiah. If you read through Isaiah 52 to 53, you will find all sorts of things that only fit Jesus. You'll read about a suffering Savior. You will read about someone who will welcome Gentiles into God's people, who will initiate a kind of baptism who would be rejected by men and cursed by God, but who would actually be bearing other people's sins, who would be tried in court and would not defend himself, who would be killed in the prime of his life without children, who was himself sinless 
and most importantly, who would live again, who would be a victor, who would be a conqueror. You're going to read all that in Isaiah 53. That's Jesus. It is the God-man Jesus who is the only hope and answer to our problems and troubles, to our needs as sinners. That may sound like a bold statement, but of course all our problems do boil down to our relationship with God. By rejecting God, we have cut ourselves off from the source of life. We have brought curse and judgment upon ourselves. We have estrangement from God, so we, we lose our purpose as human beings. Jesus restores all those things. The prophets are clear that in the Messiah, Jesus, we can find cleansing from sin, wholeness in body and soul, genuine acceptance with God and neighbor, and everlasting life. So the application for us here, as we're thinking about evangelism, is this. Evangelism isn't that complicated. Get to know the people around you. Understand their brokenness, the abuses they've suffered, their shame over the sins they've committed. Understand their need. And then tell them the good news about what Jesus can do for them. If they will repent and be baptized. And baptism is really a mark of belonging to Jesus. If they will repent of sins and come to Jesus. Well, after hearing the good news, this Ethiopian eunuch, he understood the love and grace of God. And he asked this hopeful question. See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And the answer, as we've read in Isaiah, is, is, is nothing, O Gentile. Nothing prevents you, O eunuch. Nothing prevents you, O sinner. And that's true for each person you meet out there in the world. Nothing prevents anyone from coming to faith no sin is too great that God's salvation can't overcome it. In Jesus Christ, all can be saved. Anyone can be saved. And so we, we see God's mission at work. We are invited to participate and to have faith that God can bring salvation. If only we will share the good news of Jesus with others. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for this story for the way that you've worked in our lives. Uh, many of us who are gathering for worship today and some even watching this video, you've worked in our lives. Now help us to share this good news with others who need it so desperately. Open our eyes, open our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.